Welcome everyone to the next Reginar session. In this presentation, we introduce some main economic development trends and challenges in the Central and Eastern European countries at the subnational level. Then we present in detail an approach which can be regarded on one hand as an alternative approach to economic development, and on the other hand, it is sub it supplements and supports mainstream approaches. The background and motivation of our research is that in the early 2010s, the crisis, which is still not over now, marked the end of an economic era, and some basic economic conditions have permanently changed, including the inflationary the environment, the debt, and the interest rates. And uh, this crisis highlighted the vulnerability of the growth model of national and regional economies. The most important uh, crisis, which is inherited from the 2020s, the demographic challenges, including the aging of the population and the migration of the skilled labor force from east to west. And this makes the labor markets tight, especially in Central and Eastern European countries. And as a result, the extensive increase of labor supply can no longer be a source of economic growth. And uh, as a result, both labor and also raw materials have become scarce and expensive in the 2020 decade. More emphasis is given on the intensive type of growth, that is the increase of the labor productivity. The great lockdown pointed out some areas of the economy that are indispensable for everyday life. Uh, more and more attention is given to the so-called foundational economy, that is the part of the economy which creates and distributes goods and services that uh, we rely on for everyday life. And in this presentation, we will highlight the importance of these sectors of the economy. And uh, to the development of economic uh, environment. Our research is now in the exploratory phase regarding to the Central and Eastern European macro region. Our literature context regards the growth versus development problem, which is a, a common topic in economic researches, and uh, it can be interpreted as a short-termist versus long-termist approach or in other words, the extensive type of uh, growth versus the intensive type of uh, growth or development. And because the uh, sources of expensive, uh, ex uh, intensive growth are more and more scarce, there is a need for an efficiency leap, uh, there is a need for a productivity improvement. And uh, we are delighted that this approach, the so-called beyond GDP approach, also appears in the cohesion policy of the European Union. And uh, if uh, the extensive or short-term uh, uh, path is followed by a country or a region, the a development trap will be inevitable because uh, the positive trends in the growth indicators will not be accompanied by a broader welfare improvement or other development indicators. So uh, and as a result, the chances of the sustainable growth uh, will be uh, lower if extensive growth path is followed. And our literature also relate, uh, we also relate our research to the literature of the dual economic structure, which is uh, predominant in the Central and Eastern European countries, which re rely much on the FDI uh, in the, their uh, economy, in, in their transition. And uh, it made their uh, regions and the whole economic structure vulnerable to these FDI uh, sectors. And as a result, uh, these uh, countries are challenged by uh, challenge. Uh, it, it is a challenge for them to embark on a sustainable growth path. Uh, and uh, uh, the sustainable catching up will definitely depend on the productivity growth, which can be uh, 
composed of both the in, in, more intensive investments, which is, uh, I don't think, a problem in Central and Eastern European countries, but the more important challenge is the total factor productivity growth, which must rely on innovation and human capital investments. And uh, also, uh, it will be uh, backed by uh, skilled and high quality jobs and uh, the catching up of wages, which will increase not only the, the living standard overall in, in the countries and regions, but also it has an important role in retaining and attracting skilled labor. And uh, uh, not only the human capital side of the the productivity growth uh, should be supported, but also the ecos entrepreneurial ecosystem must be uh, supported. And uh, all of this, uh, the behind these uh, approaches, uh, we would like to highlight the foundational economy approach, which will uh, help us to strengthen the the human capital uh, and the uh, well-being in uh, each region and uh, at the national level also. This approach will be introduced by Ildiko now. Thank you, Zsuzsanna. So, like Zsuzsanna said, the, the foundational economy, its basic aim is to provide for the everyday needs of the population through mundane economic sectors such as health and welfare services, education, transport, utilities, food processing and retailing. Uh, this highly neglected zone of the economy is less priori prioritized in economic strategies and uh, attention is mostly given to frontier highly uh, advanced manufacturing sectors and knowledge intensive business services. Uh, this uh, conspicuous undermining of foundational or mundane or everyday economy has led a group of uh, Manchester based scholars to actually uh, invite more policy focus and more uh, visibility, to give more visibility to this uh, hidden sector of the economy, which constitutes uh, the majority of jobs, even in the case of uh, industrialized countries, such as the United Kingdom. And uh, the economy, according to the foundational perspective, is not composed of different institutional domains or is not based on the separation of the social vs the uh, real uh, sectors, but actually the sectors are differentiated based on their welfare contribution, their, their salience for human well-being and, and welfare, and uh, also uh, through different consumption patterns that these zones are characterized with. Um, the most important sectors are the providential uh, foundational economic sectors, which are basically um, the same as the providential state, the welfare state uh, that was uh, at its peak during the 50s and the 70s. And then gradually with outsourcing and privatization, um, it has been undermined and underfunded by successive uh, neoliberal policies. And uh, so the providential services compose the large sectors such as health, social welfare and education. And the material uh, uh, economy is more composed of things that is uh, those pipes, cables and networks and branches that distribute uh, daily essentials to households um, through the material infrastructure and it comprises uh, mostly utilities, public transportation systems, telecommunications, banking, housing, food production, and say. These together are uh, form what uh, foundational scholars call collective reliance systems. And accordingly, they view the economy not as uh, not in a, in a neoliberal perspective or or as a optimal distributory system of finite and scarce resources uh, that aims to to uh, produce goods and services to satisfy basically unlimited human wants but uh, as a system of provision uh, which uh, aims to cater for the most basic needs of the population without which settlements businesses and households would not survive and uh, because they serve collective needs, 
they undermine private consumption and place more focus on collective consumption, which, by the way, also contributes to reducing the ecological footprint. So uh, there are many arguments in favor of more state responsibility, which does not mean uh, renationalization, obviously, but new forms of governance in the case of foundational sectors. And uh, these, uh, this movement also uh, rhymes well with the uh, aims of uh, like-minded uh, intellectual and, and practical movements that aim to keep wealth and circulate it within communities and not allow uh, extractive uh, practices of international companies to, to actually dominate local development policies. And uh, we have also treated a largely overlapping sector, the overlooked sector of low tax services that are essential for everyday life, such as hairdressing, maintenance, catering, tourism, a meal out, uh, as basically a part of this uh, foundational economy, because it's uh, distinctly uh, separated from the tradable sectors, which are composed of exporting uh, large firms and um, and goods uh, tradables. Uh, so all kinds of non-foundational activities that we treated uh, um, in our analysis as a different zone of the economy. So what characterizes uh, the foundational activities? Due to the requirement of local provision, these activities are largely immobile and therefore they are sheltered from global competition. They are universal because uh, all citizens are entitled to their use uh, irrespective of income or status or their position in the tradable economy. And uh, also they are dependent on local supply, which means that they offer jobs for local populations. And it is quite rare that their products and services are sold outside the regions. So, and, and these uh, collective reliance systems embodied in the financial economy services and goods are uh, without which settlements would cease to function because they uh, they are what a higher value added uh, economic activities depend on. And we also treated a closely overlapping sector of the overlooked economic activities as a part of the foundational economy in our research, uh, which is called the overlooked economy, uh, due to it being neglected by industrial policies and economic strategies. And this largely comprises low tech services uh, occasional purchases from household discretionary income, that is uh, the delay in cons consumption of uh, services that can be postponed. Um, they're not luxury services, but uh, considered like a meal out, hairdressers, catering and tourism. And then we separated this from the tradable sector. That's the main preoccupation of industrial policies and policymakers, obviously. And, and this is where uh, the large just part of the economy and transactions and exporting takes place. And the common characteristics of uh, foundational activities is the requirement of local supply which uh, and delivery, which makes them immobile and an important factor of local resilience. And also uh, the universality means that they are accessible to all the population, regardless of income or status. And also, uh, yes, face-to-face -face interaction because they demand a uh, local supply. And uh, this makes them largely sheltered from local, uh, from global competition. Um, yes, so um, very briefly about the major theoretical antecedents that uh, we can relate to in the context of foundational zones and the zonal view of the economy, which uh, defies the monolithic view of the economy. In the first uh, antecedent is uh, Ferdinand Brodel, who viewed the uh, economy as a multi-layered economy composed of the world economy of exporting enterprises and the local economy of embedded institutions, anchor institutions, uh, small and medium-sized firms and, and uh, self-employed people, and obviously the household economy of the core economy, uh, the informal economy. Um, that's based on gifting, reciprocity, voluntary uh, um, interactions. And so uh, in a Brodellian framing, uh, the economy, uh, the main objective of the economy is, um, is rather to cater for the needs of the population rather than profit or utility maximization. 
And so, according to financial theories, public services that are delivered outside the strict fear of the market economy are as much part of the economy writ large as the world economy of exporting and industries. And another concept that's highly relevant for us is a uh, is Carpolani's embeddedness concept that differentiates uh, the foundational sphere from the competitive sectors. Uh, embeddedness in this term doesn't, uh, uh, first and foremost, it uh, implies that uh, market economies do not exist in a vacuum, that they are embedded in local, cultural, political, etc. contexts, and also that uh, compensatory social policies uh, are what embeddedness actually means according to welfare state theorists. And also, uh, according to Polanyi's framing, uh, profit, uh, pursuing of profit is not the primary um, uh, purpose of the economy, but uh, it's rather to cater for the needs of the population, which uh, foundational scholars have adopted. And in framing the purpose of foundational sectors, that is to provide stable, high quality, sustainable, resilient, and local supply of foundational infrastructure and services. Also, besides constituting a new, totally new empirical reality um, differentiated from the tradable sector, uh, we found that uh, foundationalist thinking represents a totally new approach to job creation, which we could highly relate to in the Central European context, where we are um, uh, encountering a low road uh, growth uh, path to competitiveness, which is based on lowering wages, lowering taxes, less stringent environmental regulations, and of course, making the country a favorable context for mobile investments. And as opposed to this, this new approach to job creation, it doesn't aim at the numerical increase of jobs, uh, which policymakers largely mistake for good jobs, but actually they are poor, um, poor quality jobs and precarious jobs, most of the newly created jobs in manufacturing. And uh, the main claim of foundationalist uh, scholars is that by upgrading terms of work and conditions in sectors that are high in social value, but low in terms of economic rewards, actually they can significantly contribute to raising living standards among the largest part of the population, because uh, actually in highly industrialized countries, and developed countries such as the UK, the economy, 40% of the economy is composed actually by the foundational or mundane sectors. And, and these uh, fancy or glamorous uh, uh, tradable sectors like knowledge intensive business services and high end manufacturing actually compose only 4% of employment. So, so it's a negligible part of the GDP in terms of uh, its share but uh, all the more um, uh, exploited. So uh, the basic idea behind the movement is to shift the company capitalist market economy from its present extractive logic to a contributive logic that emphasizes value creation and adding value to communities and retaining that value by uh, circulating it among local suppliers and not allowing uh, international corporations to actually transfer that value to headquarter place uh, when their headquarters in more developed contexts. So it's highly relevant for us too. And uh, this new approach uh, for us is highly relevant because as uh, Jeanne has already stated, it can actually serve as a good alternative or complement FDI driven or manufacturing based growth, which uh, is not so efficient in terms of ensuring uh, ensuring cohesion, uh, regional convergence, and leaves a large part of the population behind. So as a matter of fact, in the Central European region, we can find the largest share of lagging and, and left behind places which do not matter ever until they decide to take revenge of the places that actually matter in the form of anger, resentment, and being the hotbeds of um, uh, populist policies and, and Eurosceptic parties. So uh, basically by adopting this approach, uh, which also requires a reinventing of local and regional government, which is highly centralized in our context, the countries that Jean-Navier present, uh, in order to gain a more realistic picture of how the economy actually works in local contexts, because seeing like the state doesn't allow uh, policymakers to gain this uh, 
accurate picture of the actual economy, but seeing like a locality allows this more context specific understanding of how people actually conduct transactions among themselves. And in Central European economies, particularly um, economic transactions outside the market sphere in the form of diverse economic activities do prevail and survive even in uh, market economic conditions because people, uh, most households may find that uh, market wage doesn't cover for their everyday needs. And uh, so the cities uh, in their local economic development strategies should integrate a foundational approach by focusing on local uh, provision of foundational goods and services that uh, cover the most essential and basic needs of the population instead of pursuing uh, uniform uh, supply side policies that make uh, localities extremely reliant on uh, foreign investments and outside uh, stakeholders. And there's another major point uh, to highlight in foundationalist thinking is that uh, new metrics to supplement actually traditional market indicators such as GDP, GVA metrics and productivity and employment, which do not uh, represent quality of life in, in so-called lower GVA locations, where uh, traditional place rankings uh, tend to rank places according to GDP and GVA values. And this can mask uh, enormous differences in terms of lifestyle and living conditions. Whereas uh, this new metric of foundational liability, which actually departs from household expenditure and not even uh, wage income, but residual income, that is uh, income after taxes, after housing costs and, uh, tra and transportation costs, reflects more accurately the real income situation of households. And it's a combination of uh, both income levels, mobility opportunities, social infrastructure, such as parks and libraries, and all sorts of grounded services and social care and support. So basically, our, our main question, as the title also indicated, is whether or not integrating the foundational approach can offer a way out of the territorial de de development trap for, for lagging behind regions. Well, the answer is uh, is still not found, and we leave this question open because open to debate. Because uh, our assumption is that uh, we need a strong, a tradable economy for a strong foundational economy to function. Obviously, as witnessed in the case of former mono-industrial regions or cities where the decline of a major uh, employer or a sector entailed a dramatic shrinkage of, of, um, of services as well. So, but the other is also true that um, and without a strong foundational sector, higher value added activities cannot function. So um, it's basically a mutually uh, dependent relationship. And now I will um, allow Shuja to continue. Thank you. Now I will present quickly some stylist facts about the CE, Central and Eastern European growth trends, uh, just to illustrate what we have uh, talked about in the past few minutes. Uh, the first uh, can be titled the low road of development in Central and Eastern European countries, which shows the nominal labor productivity, which is not always the same as the real labor productivity. Uh, it is more exaggerated. The, the, disparities, but we can see that there are high north, south and east, west uh, disparities and also within country disparities in the central and eastern European regions. The catching up of the national economies within our uh, macro region, which are highlighted by uh, other than blue colors, uh, we can see that uh, those countries above the diagonal line were able to improve their level of development between 2010 and 2022, and the farther above the line a country is, the more it has improved its position. 
The Baltic states have shown spectacular catching up after the global financial and economic crisis, and their level of development is similar to that of the Mediterranean member states. So there is there we can see some clubbing of these uh, uh, countries. And uh, Romania and Slovakia can be regarded as special cases because alternative measures of convergence do not reflect exactly these trends, uh, somewhat lower uh, convergence for Romania and somewhat better performance for Slovakia. And uh, we uh, also uh, see the real labor productivity growth in Central and Eastern European countries uh, uh, as opposed to the, the European growth. And uh, it is shown that uh, the tight labor markets were, where unemployment is relatively low, even in peripheral areas, and the most spectacular labor productivity growth was also uh, shown by Gro Romania and Poland, and also Czechia's trend was steady, but uh, Slovakia developed faster before uh, 2015, but the growth path of the EU and Hungary was stagnant throughout almost the whole period. And the as an illustration of the tight labor market, we can observe the unemployment rate at the subnational level. We can see that uh, uh, almost in all uh, regions, uh, the unemployment rates reached the full employment level, which can be regarded as around 4%. And the largest disparities are observable in Hungary and Slovakia. Hungary is an outlier in the sense that in the other three countries of the Visegrad 4 region, unemployment is the lowest in the capital region. Uh, 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 but in Hungary, some areas near the Austrian border permanently overperform the capital Budapest in this respect. Okay, and uh, uh, some more uh, data about the interregional disparities of per capita GDP. The one measure is the mean log deviation, which is an inequality measure commonly used for in income inequalities, but it shows that the spatial inequalities are quite persistent in all the three countries, but not in Hungary. Uh, when they decreased during the first half of the 2020s, but after they stagnated, then they, they are even higher than those in the other three countries. And the per capita GDP changes can be decomposed into three components. The green color marks the labor productivity changes, the blue color marks the uh, employment changes, and the uh, yellow color marks the demographic factor in terms of the share of the working age population uh, within the total population. And uh, we can see that in Czechia, uh, they uh, were mostly balanced, or some in most of the cases, the labor productivity green color was higher than employment rates, uh, but uh, the reverse is true for Hungary. In the case of uh, Slovakia and Poland, we can see that in Slovakia, more or less the employment growth was higher in the second half of the period, especially in the cap capital city Bratislava, but uh, they are more balanced than it was in Hungary. And the, the regional problem means that in the Central and Eastern European regions, uh, uh, the capital cities are uh, among the highest performance within all the other uh, European regions, EU regions, but uh, the peripheral regions are among the 20 least developed ones. And there is no interregional spillover effect because they cannot uh, really converge to each other. And uh, uh, the interregional disparities are also represented by the distribution of the population between different categories of de development uh, where, uh, relative to the national average. And uh, we can see that uh, uh, the two lowest categories missing in Czechia, and there is no region in the below 50% category in Poland and Slovakia, but in Romania and Hungary, the the development patterns are relatively uh, the same. In this context, or position about the role of the foundational economy in the high road of economic development is that it is, as Ildiko said, relatively large. 
and it essentially contributes to human webbing and the basic economic infrastructure, uh, which means that uh, it increases the human capital endowment and the attractivity for investment, contributes to improving labor productivity. On the other hand, competitive sectors are spatially concentrated, but uh, the foundation act, uh, economy maintains jobs in all, the, all kinds of places, including left behind places. And the empirical part of our uh, research uh, based on a database collected from the or Orbis data, uh, we included for the four Visegrad countries with 10, higher than 10 employees or high, higher than $1,000 turnover. Uh, we have six years. Uh, of data and the, one of the most important uh, indicator is the sectoral classification based on NACE codes and we collected nine financial uh, indicators and uh, within it uh, the number of employees and we differentiated with, uh, within uh, five different uh, regional types region types uh, based on their level of development or the number of their population and the share of their manufacturing sectors. Uh, the capital regions uh, represent a distinct, distinct category. Metropolitan regions are only uh, present in Poland and one in uh, Czechia, the Bruno region. And intermediate regions are generally those uh, which are not capital regions, but uh, they are the most developed within their uh, country. And peripheral and most uh, backward regions are the lagging regions. The, there is a U-shaped uh, relationship between the relative economic development and the relative share of manufacturing in the regional, in the regional economy, which is a specificity to the Central and Eastern European regions. And our data set covers around 200,000 uh, firms, and we have data for all the 115 regions. And the, the coverage is uh, quite uh, uh, varying. So, uh, for example, the value-added data are roughly missing or mostly missing in Hungary, but they are uh, very well covered in Poland. And the, the most important uh, uh, result for us is that we could identify uh, a firm that uh, based on its NACE classification code uh, that uh, which part of the economy, which economic zone, the material, the, the providential, the overlooked or the tradable in the called other sectors, does it belong? So that's why we can see the financial and employment data for each country, uh, for each uh, firms, and we can uh, classify them based on this uh, 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 system provided by the Foundation Economic Collective on its uh, web page. And uh, this is the base of our empirical uh, investigations and now our results are presented. <clears throat> we can see that uh, in these uh, charts, the relative share of the foundational ec uh, economy based on their employees, the relative number of uh, firms and the total revenues within the whole economy, whole economy total economy are uh, measured against the relative development of the region. And we can see that there is a generally a negative relationship between the relative share of the foundational economy and the, uh, the relative development. And these are all significant, but uh, we also see that the capital cities and the Polish metropolitan cities are exceptions or outliers. This is because the, the population density is positively related to the to the share of foundational economy and the population density overweights the, develop, the negative development effect. And we can see the same results, but according to the four uh, re uh, region categories that 
Generally, the largest trip that the sectors can be observed in the case of the intermediate regions and not in the capital cities, and with the exception of the capital and metropolitan regions, in this respect, the regions are regularly ordered according to their level of development. So, which means that, for example, the most back backward regions have the lowest share of uh, the tradable sector. And this is the same with the type, uh, the number of firms. The distribution of the number of firms within the four types of activities with the the regular relationship is more or less observable and the, the inequalities are even much higher in case of the operating revenues which means that uh, the finances are uh, uh, have a much more weight in the tradable sector than those in the foundational sector and this can be uh, represented if by the average employment and the average revenues of each share of each firm in the different types of activities uh, that is the chart compares the average number of employees and the average turnover by region types and in each four kinds of activities each measure is a measure relative to the total economic average and if the regions were along a diagonal line it would indicate that the average number of employees is proportional to the average turnover of course in relation to the total economy this is roughly the case in the overlooked activities but uh, in the providential activities firms relative average number of employees is much higher than their relative average uh, revenues and the case is the reverse in terms of in the case of uh, material and tradable activities and we beyond this we also computed the labor productivity measures according to uh, two basic measures the turnover based productivity and the value added based productivity we not only use the row measure but also use the, the two other measures but we averaged these three kinds of measures and uh, we can see that uh, as expected there is a capital versus rest of the regions dichotomy in all the countries but uh, mostly in Slovakia and Hungary. In Poland, there is a quite reg uh, regular downward slope in all four activity types uh, uh, according to their level of development. In Czechia, the regional inequalities outside the capital region are relatively low, uh, but in Hungary, intermediate and peripheral regions show roughly similar performance in all four categories, but that of the most backward regions is similar only in the material activities. The, in Slovakia, the regular downward slope is also roughly observable in the material and tradable sectors. And the value-added based labor productivity trends show the same patterns, with the exception of the relatively good performance of peripheral uh, regions in Hungary. And uh, finally, we summarize the results. Uh, the basic uh, distribution measures uh, that inform about the weight of the foundational economy largely are largely in line with those found in the literature. Uh, and as expected, foundational economic activities are account for a significant proportion of employment, but they are less uh, important in terms of revenues. And material activities have similarly high labor productivity, but they are operating in a quite centralized way. So their spillover effects are not really uh, strong. And some concluding thoughts about the role of the foundational economy, we, we think that uh, the fi well financed nature of the foundational sector can. Uh, uh, start a virtuous circle by contributing to human well-being and the uh, human capital endowment and thereby contributing to overall sustainable growth. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Zhuzhan and Ildiko. I think we need to quickly move on to the uh, comments of uh, Dr. Kosovsky. I will talk about fiscal decentralization, local finance and regional development. Um, yeah. Uh, short introduction uh, of course decentralization is one of the global trends uh, in the public management we have many papers about this like paper by Rudy and Sandal from 2008 John Dinelli and Liu um, what is the purpose of uh, decentralization it is mainly expectation that the 
we can bring some benefits from this decentralization, some something like uh, faster economic development and more effective provision of public services. We have also some risk related to this topic. Uh, mainly it is uh, economic income inequality and polarization, also some spatial disparities and the problem with spatial disparities in well-being and also corruption. There are also several papers about this these problems uh, related to decentralization. Uh, we have several ways of decentralization. So one of them is fiscal decentralization and this fiscal decentralization as a consequence can lead us to increase in regional inequalities. And it was demonstrated by Rodriguez Pauls and Escura in 2010 also for the examples of, of for the example of Paul. Uh, we have three dimension, dimensions of decentralization, uh, and mainly we can consider political de decentralization, administrative, and fiscal. These three dimensions of decentralization started in Poland in 1989, uh, when territorial governmental units were replaced by local public units, communes, and the system of management was decentralized. And uh, this system granted for uh, for these uh, units uh, so-called system of uh, independent financial policy. It means that every municipal com or commune uh, has its so-called own incomes, and these incomes own incomes are related to fiscal fiscal decentralization. Uh, the income of communes of municipalities in Poland, we can divide into five basic categories. The first are local taxes, local charges, and the SIPs from property because each commune in Poland has its own property. Uh, I mean, lands, houses, some um, infrastructure, it is the property. Uh, then we have shade in taxes supplying the state budget, mainly it is personal uh, tax or tax uh, collected from firms we have also some uh, other 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 uh, uh, categories like general subvention which is usually uh, done for education or or, or or for health system we have target oriented subsides it is uh, for special purpose and we have also income from foreign sources uh, especially from the budget of European Union. Uh, in fact, in this work, we considered only the first two. Uh, these are on incomes according to a special financial law, uh, which is uh, a part of uh, uh, Territorial Self-Government Units Act. Uh, the interesting thing is that the share in state taxes uh, raised uh, after 1990 in 2023, uh, 38, more than 38% of collected taxes in Polish communes stayed in communes. Uh, also, more than 6% of uh, taxes from firms uh, stayed in the commune where I registered. Uh, in 1997, it is 26 years ago, uh, it was only 16% of personal uh, tax and only 5% of tax from, from the uh, from firms stayed at the commune where, where I officially registered. Uh, we have several uh, questions, research questions uh, related to this topic. The first, how did the own income of municipalities change per capita between 1995 and, in fact, 2021? Uh, was there a spatial dependency, and if so, how did it affect the spatial differentiation of communes' incomes? How did the spatial distribution of clusters of communes with high and low income changed? Uh, what is the stability of the spatial distribution of clusters of municipalities with high and low income? Is there a relationship? Is that a relationship between the spatial articulation of the own income of municipalities per capita and the differences in the income level as measured by Gini coefficient? 
Is there a relationship between the growth rate of GDP in Poland and the process of special concentration of communities with high or low on income per capita? And finally, is any relationship between all incomes and level of socioeconomic of socioeconomic uh, development? Uh, data and methods. Uh, Polish territory is divided in uh, on three levels. In fact, the first we have provinces or regions. It is not two uh, level. Uh, no, only Warsaw is, uh, in fact, in the sense of administrative, in the in sense of administrative units, is uh, is a part of uh, Mazowiecki region. Then we have counties. It is Lau uh, one, and we have communes, gminy. Uh, it is Lau two level, uh, and it is the smallest level of administration units in Poland. Uh, all these levels have its own self government and self-governmental institutions. Uh, the regional level also has a governmental representation by Voyevoda, which is a representative of, of government in the region. And this system was finally uh, established in 1999 and was not almost not changed after 1999. Uh, communes, which are the smallest part of the system, uh, were introduced in 1973, and its number was in 2021 was uh, almost two and a half thousand of communes. There is a large heterogeneity in this set because uh, the commune is Warsaw, and the commune is also one of the small areas you can observe on this map. Uh, data. Uh, we took uh, on incomes per capita between 1995 and 2021 from Statistics Poland. GDP growth per capita from 1995 to 2021, Polish National Bank, World Bank. Bank. We calculated Gini coefficient. Uh, we are calculated spatial correlation mass I. We also uh, calculated local indicator for special association. So it is a special analysis. And we have also calculated Pearson, Pearson correlation. And uh, first, I would like to show how the distribution of uh, own incomes uh, per capita looks in Poland. Uh, this map shows uh, this distribution. We can see that we have a kind of special pattern. Uh, we have uh, communes which are more rich on the west part of Poland and in the north part of Poland. Uh, communes which are, let's say, the most, uh, the poorest, which are the poorest, are mainly concentrated in eastern part of Poland. Uh, it is a very special, special pattern, which is in fact, typical for Poland, many phenomena is uh, many phenomena are many phenomena are let's say uh, distributed like this one that we have more richer on communes on the west. We have uh, communes with smaller unemployment on the west, larger on the east, and so on. Uh, we have also some concentration uh, around Polish, the largest agglomerations like Warsaw, Krakow, Wrocław, Poznań. And what is also important, um, uh, around the place where we have uh, some mining, uh, like coal mining in, on the south or uh, coal mining, uh, brown coal mining on the south of Łódź. So, uh, so these are, let's say, some exclusions from this uh, general uh, general pattern. Uh, some statistics for incomes, uh, for all incomes in our communes, we have a uh, permanent growth of uh, of the low the, of the own incomes in Polish communes. Uh, in 1995, uh, let's say, uh, we had uh, some, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we had a lot of uh, gminas which were very, very poor. 
the lowest low income, the lowest low income in 1995 per capita was about 50 zlotys. Uh, now it is more or less uh, 550 zlotys in 2000, in 2021. Uh, in the maximum uh, rise uh, from, if I am right, from uh, from uh, more or less uh, 11,000 of Zlotis to uh, more than 40,000 of Zlotis. Uh, there's a special commune. There is a coal mining, uh, brown coal mining uh, industry with a uh, large electric plant. Uh, and they pay really serious taxes to this commune and also some, uh, some, some taxes related to uh, ecology. Uh, so we can observe that uh, we have large heterogeneity. We have large heterogeneity. Also, median and mean were rising, uh, and the division uh, of this own incomes is stabilized as we can observe after two thousand after two thousand eleven. Uh, we have also calculated special autocollation, and then I will so sh show some maps related to special autocollation. Uh, we can see that the red line represents a special autocollation. Uh, at the beginning, and in 2019 95, uh, we had special autocollation at the level 005. So it means that we had almost randomly distributed uh, pattern of uh, own incomes in Poland. Uh, in 2021, uh, this uh, the uh, spatial autocollision index uh, is uh, all, more than all 20, sorry, more than all, all, all 30. Uh, we can also observe that uh, Gini coefficient, uh, which is non spatial, as we know, uh, at the beginning rises. Uh, till 2008, and now it is uh, this uh, Gini coefficient is going down. And we can also observe uh, some, let's say, similarity of uh, GDP growth in Poland and this spatial autocollation coefficient. Uh, of course, uh, we can try to conclude this, 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 uh, this, uh, this results and Unfortunately, the correlation between Gini coefficient and Moa coefficient was negative, so uh, we don't have any relationship between between uh, spatial and aspatial, let's say, uh, pattern. Uh, but the correlation between GDP growth rate and Moa coefficient uh, was only uh, sorry, I I just uh, made a small. <laughs> mistake because I have read something different. Uh, the Pearson correlation between Gini and Moran was negative and was statistically significant, but correlation between GDP growth and Moran coefficient was statistically insignificant. So we have no, in fact, we have no relationship between GDP per capita and uh, growth and uh, and uh, spatial autocollation process, in fact, a spatial clustering process. Uh, we have LISA results uh, on these maps, and we can observe how it, uh, how clustering process changed between 1995 and 2021. At the beginning, we had uh, several uh, clusters of communes with high incomes per capita, uh, mainly in the south part of Poland and Warsaw, which is in fact uh, in the middle of nowhere. It is surrounded by areas with really, really low uh, on incomes per capita. We have also clusters on the border uh, with Germany, uh, the, the year 1995, uh, because on the border with Germany, we have some cities which are divided between, or, or towns which are divided between Poland and, 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 uh, and Germany. So uh, the main revenue of these communes located at the German border was so-called trade tax, which is local tax. Uh, after 2000, this cluster, which is located on the west, disappear, disappears. And we have new clusters, which are mostly concentrated on the north, which is 
it is uh, mainly a uh, result of uh, so-called uh, two stacks and mainly around large uh, metropolitan uh, metropolitan areas yeah uh, in 2010 2015 and 2025 we can observe that these red clusters these clusters of uh, rich communes in terms of uh, income per capita or incomes per capita uh, that the, these areas are rising and we have in some cases we have uh, around the metropolitan city not only the first circle of communes uh, in these clusters but also the second circle or part of the second circles of communes uh, in this in this cast in this clusters so uh, we can also uh, analyze how these clusters were changed uh, year by year. So there is a map which summarizes uh, all these previous uh, results. We can observe the stability of the of clusters. So we can see that the most stable clusters of uh, each communes uh, are located around metropolitan areas like Warsaw, Warsaw, like Poznan, Wrocław, uh, like Katowice in Silesia, Kraków, and Gdańsk on the north. And we have also areas where we have permanent uh, problem with uh, low or on incomes per capita in communes, mainly in rural part of uh, of eastern of eastern uh, of eastern Poland. So uh, how it influence on regional development. If we compare these two maps, the maps of stability of clusters and the map of uh, regional development, there's a map of which shows us uh, socioeconomic development level of communes in Poland. We can observe that there's a high correlation between uh, low incomes, uh, own incomes of uh, communes and the socioeconomic uh, development level. <clears throat> uh, what is the result of how high or income um, uh, in local policy? Uh, the commune which has high local incomes can, let's say, be more intensive in public investment, in investment in infrastructure, mainly in infrastructure roads, uh, Transportation system like trams uh, can prepare also uh, areas for infrastructure infrastructure in areas uh, which are devoted for international, uh, let's say, uh, investment. Uh, and these communes are a part of mainly of, of global economy like Warsaw or some smaller cities like Poland. We have international cooperation here. Uh, the local economy uh, is rather in this the poorest local communes, uh, the poorest uh, communes with the smaller the, the smallest uh, on incomes per capita. Uh, these communes are mainly rural with agriculture. So uh, because budgets are really small, um, there is no local public investment or this public investment is, is really small. So they cannot attract some investors because lack of infrastructure. Uh, even so-called Robin tax, hood tax uh, doesn't stop this polarization tendency uh, because uh, how works uh, Robin Hood tax? Uh, there are special transfers from the richest communes to the uh, to the uh, to the poorest communes uh, it is so called robin hood tax or uh, equilibrium tax uh, the idea of this tax was to um, avoid such polarization but as you can observe uh, this uh, this uh, process uh, doesn't work in this way uh, how big is uh, typical uh, typical uh, typical uh, uh, Robin Hood tax? For example, my city Poznan pays about eighty millions of zlotys per year. This uh, Robin Hood tax it is uh, more or less twenty millions of 
20 million of euros, but uh, cities like Warsaw or some regions like Mazowiecki pays much more than this 20 uh, million euros per, per year. Uh, so uh, some conclusions, as I showed, uh, we had a systematic increase in municipalities' incomes, and also we had as we had, um, of course, uh, the, the the difference between the smallest and the largest values also increased. And we can observe uh, the process of spatial dependence of communes on income per capita. And this uh, process is more stronger and stronger uh, during the time. Uh, of course, as a consequence, we have a special concentration and special polarization of the distribution of municipalities with similar value of, 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 uh, of all income per capita. Mm, mainly, yeah, the high, income communes are more or less uh, around the largest urban agglomerations. Krakow is a special, special, special exclusions and some, some uh, places where natural resources are exploited and the coastal belt. We can also observe that the special uh, polarization increased, increased um, especially after two, uh, 2020. Uh, we can also see that because GDP per capita uh, is not correlated with, with uh, this process of uh, spatial dependence, so we can observe that, the, in fact, uh, the economic situation did not drive spatial polarization. But we can observe that we have the influence of the on incomes on the level of socioeconomic development because these two maps are, as I we could observe, uh, correlated. So thank you for your attention. Uh, I would like, because I, I should start very quickly, I would like also thank you for invitation to this seminar. Uh, Zuzha, especially for you, because you wrote to me this email with invitation also. Thank you, Christina. So I could present this paper. Mm, I would like to say something, one, uh, something more for uh, one or two minutes, maybe. Uh, what is the relation between the, my presentation and the presentation which was pre uh, previously presented by, by, by Zuzanna and uh, her colleague? Uh, if we consider this uh, foundational economy, we have some services uh, like uh, education uh, and um, some cultural services, welfare, and so on, which uh, girls were before me were, were, were talking about. In Poland, in fact, these services should be, uh, should be, must be delivered by local communes. Uh, so if they to do it, yeah, they have, they should have uh, uh, special sources of of finance because uh, general subventions are too small. So, if if any community wants to have good level of these local services like education, uh, the community cannot use only general subvention from the state, but also should pay its own money, which are delivered by own incomes. How to increase own incomes? Attract people to live in this commune, attract investors to uh, invest in this commune and to register there uh, and register there uh, its activity. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tomasz. And it was also interesting that in your maps, there must also be some correlations with political party preferences. I believe. Uh, it is, but in fact, it is more complicated. Uh, I would say it is, uh, of course, political uh, preference of, of, of people who live in special areas, but there's also 
uh, such problem that uh, the structure of uh, economy in commune it also has uh, let's say influence on 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 political preference i would say because if we have the commune where there is registered large state owned plant so it is obvious that workers mainly support ruling party like we have in lower silesia in poland the situation with um, k h g k g h m it is a mining company large so they are all supporting always ruling party because uh, they can stay in the for example in management staff at special position yeah yeah it goes into two directions yeah yeah interesting thank you uh we'll have to leave it there for now but uh, we also have contribution by dr egri thank you very much thank you uh, for having me here uh both presentation uh is about a little bit club convergence so Zsuzsa told us the 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 club convergence the club convergence of the uh, uh countries and maybe the regions and dr kosovsky's presentation uh maybe it's all it's about the conver convergence clubs in uh, uh poland based on mun municipalities so i will uh, i would i would like to continue with this issue uh in the central and eastern european uh area so i reject the uh, uh hypothesis of universe and global convergence and I would like to show some evidence about the club convergence uh, in the Central Eastern European region, uh, region which means that uh, we can find uh, uh, a spatially differentiated equilibrium, equilibrium uh, states, so different steady states in the uh, sea regions. Uh, as you know, it, the convergence is an exciting issue, especially for Central and Eastern Europe, because no country has yet reached the average uh, economic performance of either the whole EU or uh, the old member states, the EU15. So in, in, in addition, uh, we can see that there are really outstanding territorial differences in the central, in the, in the region. Two-thirds of the uh, 24 regions with the lowest GDP per capita are located in the region, while five of the uh, 25 most development regions uh, are in the are in the Central Eastern Europe uh, too. So, in the last financial uh, period of the European Union, the CE region received almost sixty percent of the economic, social, and uh, territorial cohesion expenses. For this region, we have to talk. It is necessary to explain the issues of the convergence and the catching up in the uh, region. So, uh, I would like to share some. Uh, preliminary in information about my presentation. So I will I would like to talk about uh, club convergence club convergence in the region. By the sea region, it's a uh, it's a wider region than uh, uh, than in uh, Zsuzsa and Eriko's presentation. We mean eight countries: the Visegrad four countries, as you see, uh, Poland, Czechia, Slovakia, Hungary, and uh, Slovenia, Croatia. Romania and Bulgaria. The regional level, it's not the traditional uh, regional policy uh, territorial level. It's not to, uh, it's it's not the NATS2 level, but the NATS3 and the NATS3 plus uh, region. NATS3 uh, uh, plus means that we merged the cities and the catchment areas. So as you can see it in uh, uh, Varsava, in case of Varsava, in cases of Varsava, or, 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 or in case, case of Prague, or, or, or uh, in case of Hungary, Budapest and uh, Pest were merged into one uh, region by the Eurostat. It's not a new thing. The indicator of economic convergence is the gross value added per capita measured by purchasing power parities and constant prices in US dollars. Uh, and the examined period is the new is the period of the new millennium, so after 2000. So we used a log P test. Uh, uh, it's a useful method uh, to delimit uh, different uh, in, uh, convergence clubs with different uh, uh, income paths, with different uh, steady states in Central and Eastern Europe. 
Then uh, we use the, the club convergence, uh, convergence. Uh, that is, we describe the factors influencing the formulation of clubs. Uh, the method is the ordinal logistic regression. On the left side of this slide, you can see the preliminary results, which show the spatial distribution of the convergence clubs in Central and Eastern Europe. So the main characteristics of the convergence clubs is that there is no convergence between clubs, uh, but convergence can be observed within clubs. So the final re results show a multi-seven speed, uh, uh, multi-speed seven speed Central Eastern Europe uh, with clear uh, differentiation by the GVA per uh, capita. And our panel data contains one outstanding, uh, one high, one average, and four, uh, maybe we can call it uh, forgotten places or left behind places or backward regions. So for spatial, uh, for low income spatial uh, clubs. Clubs in blue and, and uh, darker green uh, have above average economic performance, while yellow, orange, and, um, and brown clubs have below average performance uh, in the region. Uh, the next uh, slide, the next figure, describes the relative transition of the seven, uh, seven convergen convergence clubs in the examined uh, period. As a percentage of the as the percentage of the cross-sectional average on a log scale, all seven clubs show a clearly different path in terms of uh, economic performance uh, through the whole period. So uh, we can see that all seven clubs uh, show clearly different paths uh, in terms of economic performance through the whole periods. The behavior of convergence clubs. Uh, develops according to mirror circle cumulative uh, causation. So that means that the high income uh, clubs, convergence clubs, increase their incomes, as you can see uh, in case of the top two convergence clubs, while the low income ones, the bottom three clubs, have become uh, even poorer by the end of the, uh, end of the uh, period under examination. So we can see the convergence clubs confirm the presence of various development traps in C region, especially for low uh, and middle income uh, traps uh, in the C regions. And based on our results, the territorial differences stabilize uh, over, over time in the, in the C region and became persistent after the 2007-2009 uh, uh, economic rise. So my Next figure is about uh, another catching up uh, uh, performance in the region. It's an interesting question, uh, maybe whether the clubs have already reached the economic performance of the EU15. So uh, we have compared the different averages, uh, uh, different averages uh, with the average of the uh, EU15 uh, uh, performance economic performance. So it can be concluded that Club One reached uh, uh, Club One reached it 2007. So the economic performance, the GVA, GVA per uh, capita, while uh, Club Two shows uh, a very strong and the Club Three uh, shows uh, a weak convergence to the reference value, uh, reference value in the exam in the period. So the three clubs uh, uh, affect almost 60% of the CE uh, population. Uh, in case of Club 1, it's only 7% uh, of uh, total population. And the other convergence clubs show a distant growth and position. There is no convergence. There, there is a very slow, very, very slow convergence to the EU uh, 15 uh, performance. So my last presentation, it's about the main drivers of the development in CE region. Uh, region. So this, um, these results are based on the ordinal, ordinal logistic regression. Uh, regression. And um, we uh, examine that uh, uh, what uh, development fact, what factors are responsible for the uh, formation of the convergence clubs uh, by the international uh, literature. We use initial conditions and uh, so-called structural characteristics. And uh, <coughs> we found that the convergence cloud are mostly influenced by the initial conditions, especially the initial level of development. 
So we can say that the path dependence can be observed in the development processes of uh, CE uh, region. In addition, we found that populations, population size is an important predictor uh, that contributes to the cumulative, cumulative uh, causation in the region. So this is a clear relation to the new economic uh, uh, geography, I think. Uh, and an in interesting thing that high tech patents are not significant determinant, but it's not a not a uh, uh, it's not a new thing because uh, uh, we can see that the uh, in some regions there are economic convergence, but the convergence of the knowledge economy is not typical in the C region by the international uh, uh, literature. So based on the structural characteristics, uh, routine and info communication uh, services are significant, by, uh, but, but not a strong predictor uh, in uh, development of convergence clubs, which indicates the reorganization of the region's employment uh, structure. And we can say that the high proportion of public and other services restrains the development of the CE uh, regions uh, under our uh, examination. Uh, and in uh, addition, in, in addition, uh, it is interesting uh, that uh, 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 <clears throat> it is interesting fact that spatial spillover are not significant factor in the explanation of convergence clubs. The reason for this being is to use the country dummies. So this indicates that spatial uh, spillover effects prevail only within countries not between countries, between the different uh, uh, regions of the countries, but only within countries. So uh, I think that uh, uh, my uh, results confirm, so prove the hypothesis of uh, uh, club uh, convergence in the C region. And I think it's related both of the presentation, as I mentioned uh, at the start of the, uh, and uh, at the start of my presentation, so thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, please don't have it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sultan. The message is clear. So uh, maybe if you just remove the presentation, we can still have a minute or two for questions or exchange among everyone present here. May I have a question? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. I have a question. One question I have to... Zuzana, we can observe, yeah, you, you showed us that there are some differences between productivity within Central and Eastern European countries. Do you have any idea how to explain these differences? It will be for future research, but uh, yeah. mainly due to the structural characteristics of the country. And uh, according to the literature, the most important uh, explanatory factor is the functional specialization of each region, that to which functions, uh, and uh, as you can see, the well-known smile curve explaining the relationship between value added and uh, the, the place of the uh, firms or regions within the, the value chain. So I think that the most uh, important factors are the, uh, on one hand, the structural characteristics, and of course, the other is the geography, uh, which are closer to the Western markets. But uh, this is a very big problem for us in the um, Western most, uh, 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 counties, for example, also in Vosch and Zola County, because the cross-border uh, labor movement uh, co makes these uh, uh, counties uh, more and the, um, and they, they, the the skilled labor uh, migrates uh, or or. Uh, <clears throat> uh, works on the other side of the border, and uh, I can, uh, I showed the, the change of the labor productivity in these westernmost uh, countries, the counties, and uh, uh, only these were the three only three counties where the labor productivity decreased after the second half of the 2020. Yes. And uh, anyway, these countries are highly reliant on foreign direct investment, and they also closer to the uh, 
in the Austrian border. So they have a relatively high uh, initial level, but they are decreasing uh, after the second half of the 2010s. So this means that the, the tradable sector, the FDI orientation is not a long-term uh, guarantee for, uh, for a steady development. Okay, so yeah, um, and if I may, I, some small remark here, yeah, of course, to your presentation because yet, yeah, um, because you have a division on capital region one usually metropolitan and so on. Yeah, in Poland, we have a very specific situation because Warsaw is a capital and theoretically it is the you know, the capital as. And we know what it means that it is theoretically the best city, and in many, in many, in many indicators. But when we are looking, if we are comparing Warsaw with uh, metropolitan cities in Poland, uh, then we can see that the, the first, uh, the unemployment rate in Warsaw is not the lowest. Yeah, for example, in my city is the lowest. There are some also some communes in Poland which are have uh, lower unemployment rate than Warsaw. And what is unexpected? Uh, Warsaw uh, is not the city with the highest uh, average wage. Krakow and Gdańsk have higher average salaries, average wages than Warsaw even. Yeah? So, yeah, it is the capital city, but yeah, maybe in Poland we are in uh, the situation uh, which is not in Hungary or, or in Czech Republic or Slovakia, that we have a kind of equilibrium in our settlement system. Yeah, there's a Warsaw, which is, of course, let's say, better than metropolitan cities, but this metropolitan cities together also try to do a kind of spatial equilibrium. So, yeah, yeah, so it is. Uh, Maybe also the reason why, uh, in the case of Poland, this labor productivity and all these indicators, in the case of also, are not so. There is not so large gap. Yeah, also in, in the case of I don't know Slovakia or, 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 or Czech Republic. Any final comment or question from anyone? While you're thinking, I should also mention that a good opportunity to continue these discussions is uh, next year. The town of Kecskemét in central Hungary happens to host the annual conference of RSAI. Uh, if you can make it, then it's a good idea. And otherwise, if there are no questions or comments left, I would very much like to thank uh, uh, to all you contributors for this webinar. And uh, please do follow us, stay in touch through uh, YouTube, where we have the Reginar channel, or on Facebook, in which the latest uh, events and webinars are announced. We try to hold them bi-monthly, so it's worth to, to, to like us and follow us, and then you can always stay in touch with our latest uh, episodes of the Reginar. Reginar is the keyword, and then you will find us on social media. So thank you uh, for all of you again, and uh, yeah, I think we can call Thank it. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.